Добрый день, меня зовут Марина Киселева, и сегодня у нас в гостях Джоша Броге, основатель первого блокчейн-университета Вулф. Джоша, good afternoon. Uh, and my first question, I would like you to tell our audience about your blockchain university. So, blockchain university, what's this? Right, so we're using a blockchain to enforce regulatory compliance in the university and quality assurance. And the goal of using a blockchain here is to code in a whole series of European metrics, which allow us to be open admissions for faculty and selective admissions for students. This is quite unusual. Usually there's a lot of human oversight into the admission of faculty members. But at Wolf University, qualified faculty members will have a background check and will be able to join with very little permission seeking. Mm -hmm. So the advantage of the blockchain for us is uh, first and foremost about allowing professors to create their own accredited courses and join the platform almost in a free manner uh, without asking permission. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is the educational process organized in the university? Right. Well, the initial courses that we will be offering in the spring of 2019 will be in the Oxford tradition. And um, that's my home university, so it's what we're most familiar with. But these courses are really taught uh, in very small groups, so peer-to-peer, person-to-person, between a professor and a student. And the blockchain provides us with a highly regulated environment in which to conduct this teaching, whether it's over a video conferencing call or even meeting in person. Mm -hmm. um, we can enforce regulatory compliance on quality, and this makes it possible to accredit the conversations between teachers and students. And this tradition of having teachers speak directly with one or two students um, is a very interesting one and one that we're familiar with uh, as the founders of Wolf, uh, as a whole group of people from an institution that uses this style of education. What's the difference between a uh, blockchain university and classical university such as Oxford or something like that and uh, very popular online platforms? Yeah. So, of course, Oxford is a brick-and-mortar university with people uh, physically arriving to the campus and signing up for studies. And on the faculty side, it's extremely difficult to get a position at Oxford. Uh, and an online university is often open admissions on the student side and uh, doesn't have any live instruction between the faculty member and the student. Now, sometimes there's synchronous teaching between the faculty and the students but this is often between a very large group of students uh, watching in on a seminar. So lower on the interaction scale, um, but still potentially synchronous. At Wolf, we're making it possible for faculty members to join quite freely, provided that they have a research doctorate, and we're providing very high interaction levels between the professors and the students. So mm -hmm. again, very small groups of students, two or three, speaking directly with a professor who's an expert in the field. Mm -hmm. So you have very small groups of students and is it, uh, do you treat it as an um, advantage or disadvantage of this process? Well, one of the great challenges, uh, of course, in education is scale because we need to build probably the equivalent of 100 new universities over the next decade just to service the increasing demand of students who have rising incomes and will be seeking university education. Now, online teaching, which can reach 100,000 students, is very good at servicing that demand. Mm -hmm. But it faces some real challenges, uh, challenges like attrition. So most students drop out of online education. There are real struggles to, to keep people engaged. And personal interaction is one mm -hmm. of the key issues that helps students stay involved in online education. So we, we view what we're doing as um, solving that problem to a significant extent. But at the same time, a teacher cannot interact with as many students. Mm -hmm. So there are questions about scalability. Mm -hmm. And the way we achieve scalability is to say a student has to work for two or three days, very hard work, writing a big essay, reading hundreds of pages, mm -hmm. maybe doing a pile of mathematical equations before they meet with that professor. So a student has a full workload if they meet a professor once or twice a week. Whereas a mm -hmm. professor can meet three or four groups of students a day so that asymmetry 
makes it possible to scale to some extent. Now, you're not going to have a professor meeting hundreds of thousands of students, but they can effectively meet 40 students in a week, and that's enough for them to pay their salary twice over, potentially, and that makes it possible to have decent tuition costs on the student side and good salaries on the teacher side. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, well, the assessment of students' performance? Yep. So the assessment model we use is both formative and cumulative. So on the formative side, there's a kind of weekly essay that has to be submitted by the student. Mm -hmm. And they get a, a mark or a grade on this. And on the cumulative side, they have to uh, answer an exam set of questions, usually essay questions, where there are maybe 10 possible questions. And they get to select three uh, and, and write at some length in response. Or they have to compose a much larger essay uh, which is reviewed by a different faculty member than the teacher. So they have a kind of external examiner on it. And even a live uh, oral examination between the mm -hmm. external examiner and the student. So th this is a very traditional way of doing formative and summative assessment that we use at Oxford and which we're trying to make more widely available now. Uh, do you provide students with certificates and diplomas? Yep. So one of the reasons we are using a blockchain is to enforce the regulatory compliance to meet the demands of the European higher education area's accreditation process. So this is an ongoing and, and arduous process, and it's the reason why we're delaying the admission of students until the spring of 2019. Um, but yes, so this will be a degree issuing institution up to the doctoral level. So you can receive you know, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD. Well, if we talk about uh, the technology of blockchain, how could it be used in uh, well, classical universities? Mm. So the way we are designing our system, we capture data at a very low level um, when a student attends class, when they submit their essay, when they receive a mark on their exam. All of these things are put into our platform and recorded. And there's nothing to prevent this process from happening on a brick and mortar institution. So in theory, you could take an existing physical campus and simply adopt our software platform and join the larger network. So there would be nothing to prevent uh, a traditional university from using the same mm -hmm. network. And then the network functions as a kind of global back office, which handles administration for multiple institutions. Does the technology of blockchain uh, have any drawbacks? Well, there are special challenges associated with it, and those challenges tend to increase as you gain the benefits of, of using mm -hmm. a blockchain. And some blockchains are more flexible than others. Um, there's mm -hmm. no such thing as one style of blockchain, right? And so the blockchains that we're using tend to have high levels of flexibility. They're vo very low energy cost. Uh, they're very fast. Mm -hmm. but. Um, there, there are challenges around uh, correcting data. There are challenges around building costs. So it, it costs maybe 10 to 15% more to initially set up the blockchain. Mm -hmm. But those costs in the area of software development tend to offset much larger administrative costs in the periphery. So you have very large savings around the software development, but uh, slightly higher costs for the software itself. I would ask you one more question about the future of education. Could you name the trends that the use of blockchain technology would lead in the process of higher education in the future? Mm. Maybe within five or seven years? Yeah. So I think that blockchain will be increasingly adopted by existing institutions, and this will lower the costs of administration. So the amount of bureaucracy required per student, which involves human hours, will be reduced. And I think that will make it possible to have better student-faculty ratios so that smaller groups of students are meeting with faculty members. And this will probably happen in conjunction with increasingly able online course instruction, which means that certain kinds of courses will be automated, right? So if you want to memorize facts, uh, there are very good online systems for helping you memorize facts. But when it comes to the softer skills of reasoning and rhetoric and creative composition, these things are, are often best handled by um, actual human interaction. And there's nothing that can replace interacting between a professor with domain-specific knowledge and one student so that you can help shape the way that student thinks. 
And if a blockchain can allow us to facilitate those interactions, then I think that's worth celebrating. What other technologies apart from blockchain will change uh, the education future? Well, I think as we see a greater permutation of technology in developing countries, um, almost nobody will fail to have a mobile phone with a good resolution screen and good connectivity, which brings a whole new set of students and teachers into the environment. And as we learn how to connect students and teachers better in a regulated way, you can have much better matching between students and teachers. Um, and that can be combined with, say, artificial intelligence, with, which can both help with the matching and provide help in other areas of education. So mm -hmm. I, I think uh, better network connectivity, artificial intelligence, these are some key areas which will be a great help to education as we go forward. Okay. And my last question, do you have Russian students and, at your university, and do they have uh, an opportunity to enter? Well, this is a great question. So when we finish launching our network, it will be possible for any group of professors anywhere in the world to join the platform and form an institution on that platform, which means uh, we are enforcing certain kinds of regulatory requirements, but language is not one of them. So it would be possible to have a group of Russian professors join the platform and take on Russian-speaking students, uh, and they would all be earning degrees through our system because the regulatory compliance would be through our system. So we very much look forward to having uh, the first Russian colleges on the platform. Okay, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you very much. Joshua Brogge, основатель первого блокчейн университета, Wolf.